Um, welcome to Grosvenor Gallery. My name is Charles Moore. Uh, tonight we are speaking to two people who don't really need any introductions. Uh, William, Daniel, D William Dalrymple and Steve McCurry. Uh, photographs by the internationally acclaimed author and historian are currently on display at Grosvenor Gallery as part of his exhibition, The Traveller's Eye, which runs from the 1st to the 30th of July 2021. Uh, joining William and I to discuss some of the image images in the show is Steve McCurry, one of the most iconic figures in contemporary photography for the last four decades. He's responsible for some of the most recognisable photographs of recent times and has travelled South Asia and the globe extensively. I, I am delighted that you're both able to join me this evening. Um, Steve, come to you first. You first visited India in uh, 1974, is that right? Um, I, can I ask the reason for that first trip and can you sort of put your finger on what it was about the country that captured you and kept you coming back? Well, from a, a young age, I always wanted to travel. I remember looking at old life magazines from the 50s and the 60s. Um, so that was really my ambition. And during school, I traveled in um, Africa and Europe and Latin America. And so when I started to embark on a freelance photography career, I thought, you know, where haven't I been? Where, where would I like to go? Uh, yeah, I thought about Russia, I thought about China, but the place that was the most accessible, in some ways the most intriguing to me was, was India. Uh, India is such an incredibly diverse uh, country and I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna go there, spend about six weeks, and then I'm gonna go over and work in the Mediterranean. Uh, anyway, that, that six weeks turned into two years. <laughs> I literally spent two years um, you know, wandering through India, Pakistan, went into Afghanistan, and I was kind of hooked at that point. I kept going back because I it was so, it had so much depth to the subcontinent. I kept going back and back. And so this that's like 40 years ago, I've uh, been back dozens of times. And I still feel like there's so much more to discover and so much more to learn. Uh, I, I worked in Tibet and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Nepal, but it's just, to me, that's really the heart of my work and the part of the world that I just love to go back and continue to you know, learn about and wander and explore. I, I actually I listened to something this morning in a, a, an interview with a British chef from India originally, and he said, you could live for 10,000 years and not even get close to discovering the secrets of Indian cookery. And, you know, if that's just cookery, <laughs> I can't yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Well, I'd just like to congratulate Wally on this incredible exhibition, but I, I have to say one thing. Uh, a writer is not supposed to be this good. You know, somebody who <laughs> spends most of his time, yeah. you know, award-winning books, historian, I mean, it's just not supposed to work that way. <laughs> so I, I, I'm really quite uh, kind of jealous that somebody who doesn't really spend all of his time photographing <laughs> is able to come in and and, and jump into it and actually make astonishingly uh, wonderful pictures. And um, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, we talked about, you know, there's some tradition in writing, uh, writers who have also photographed, you know, there's of course Bruce Chatwin, uh, but, but doesn't, isn't Lewis Carroll, didn't he also um, yep. photograph quite yep. a bit? So you're, you're right. a good company. I think if we could find, um, uh, a Lewis Carroll photograph now, uh, they'd be worth quite a bit of money. <laughs> so I, I think for any smart collector, the good move, the, the right thing is to jump in early on some of these pictures because it, it's almost like a, getting a stock early in the game. These are only gonna go up in value. So anyway, that's my, but it, you're not, you know, <laughs> Writers don't do this. They, they're not that good. <laughs> I, I got to say that one other thing about um, your technique, I've actually, in the last few years, have gravitated 
more towards working with a cell phone. I know you, th this work is with a cell phone and the quality, I mean, when you talk about cell phone photography of you know, 10, 20 years ago, who knows what the quality was. Now, the quality is exceptional. And I think you've really, it's a really smart move. I think you're, you're it's very discreet. It's in your pocket. Uh, it, it's, it, but the results are uh, astonishing. So, you know, I, I take my hat off to you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Really nice to be I, I don't I don't what we, we can gift you after this wonderful uh, <laughs> endorsement. But thank you so much. Yeah. That's incredibly moving. I've been well, you know, you know, I, I just want to say this, you know this because I've told you many times, but uh, I've been a huge, huge fan of your work ever since I found um your work in National Geographics at school. There used to be a great pile of National right. Geographics in, in the school yeah. library. And I used yeah. to just look through your your particularly the, the your, your your work in South Asia. Uh, and yeah. when I was stuck in, in, in kind of snowbound, mist surrounded North Yorkshire moors uh, with kind of icicles on the library window, and I'd be looking at these gorgeous pictures of Sri Lankan <laughs> beaches or uh, <laughs> amazing sort of Cambodian temples or uh, uh, any of your classic shots in Rajasthan of uh, women in a dust storm, or whatever. And this was a dream. I mean, one of the reasons I went to India, I think, was to see the world that you'd uh, brought to us yeah. all. And, you know, one forgets that in the uh, 1980s, you know, there was much less around of imagery. You didn't have Instagram. You didn't have all the stuff. And, and, and coming across yeah. a National Geographic with your work was a kind of open door, a, a, a kind of uh, an invitation to, uh, to follow in your footsteps. And I did. Yeah. So I have a lot, I have a lot to thank you for. Um, Great. And yeah. The only difference, I should say, is that Brad was that obviously you've always worked and are the great master of color. Uh, I'm colorblind. <laughs> so I've, always, yeah. I've always opted for, for black and white. I also, it was at school, you know, you could do um, black and white photography quite cheaply, develop it yourself. You didn't have to pay for developing because you were doing it yourself. The only cost was the chemicals, the, the paper, and the film. Um, and so starting off doing photography in black and white uh it was it, it it was that which drew me in so while i was looking at your work and, and, and dreaming of all that color um all i could afford to do in the city yeah. and, and the way i developed my style because for me photography preceded writing um you know you you've always known me as, uh, as a writer and, and and read the books first and then uh, only seen the photographs now but for me i was i had a contacts when i was 17 and, and won a few you know photography awards locally and uh, in Britain, um, and that was what I was initially. And it's only uh, since I discovered cell phone photography that you've got this thing in your pocket, so it doesn't you're not carrying extra equipment if you're on a story, or uh, that I've gone back to this form. Um, and it's been a complete liberation. It's been so exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. and the way you can with just a simple free downloaded program like Snapseed reproduce the work that used to take hours in the dark room when you were sitting there dodging and burning and, uh, and doing all sorts of stuff with high contrast papers and uh, whatever. Um, now you just do it sitting on your sofa at home watching the telly. Uh, which yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, do you miss that? Do you miss the sort of physical element of developing photographs and being able to manipulate things by hand because the shift from analog I, to I used to and certainly at the time it was very I mean, there's nothing more exciting than sitting in a dark room watching a, 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 a white sheet of paper suddenly take on the contours and the shape and the uh, and the mass of some scene that you photographed and watching it in that red dark room light uh, coming through and, and hoping it didn't you know didn't go too far but it wouldn't be too black or you overexposed yeah. it or whatever but nowadays, I have to say, looking back, the ease of digital. You've, you've also, I mean, you famously, Steve, were one of the last people to leave film, weren't you? You, were, you shot, I think, the last reels of Kodachrome ever made. Yeah. Well, film was wonderful. Uh, it was very slow. Um, you needed a lot of light uh, with Kodachrome. It was, it, was the, it was 64, it was the ISO. Um, and with, with digital, uh, you know, you, you uh, can photo, you know, you can shoot a much, much lower light. 
Um, you don't have all those mess of chemicals. You can look at the composition. You can look at the light. You can re re reevaluate your position. Whereas with with film, you never quite knew what you what you had. It was so you know you would hope. And then when you got home, sometimes you realized it wasn't in focus. But with with uh, digital, you can kind of evaluate all that. So I, I'm a big fan of uh, digital photography. I, I like to look at the light. I like to look at the composition and at the moment. Um, so yeah, no, that that's uh, to me, it's a big leap forward. And also to... the kind of stuff, you remember all those days when you would, you know, you'd have some superb shots that you'd really lucked out on and then you developed it. And there was one bit of grit in your camera from some Rajasthan yeah. <laughs> which, which had scratched an entire line along the whole yeah. film, uh, yeah, or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, there was always far more pitfalls with that one. Yeah, or yeah. somehow you managed to expose the negative and, you know. Oh my God, yeah. And so there's, yeah, a lot of, there's a lot of love for film, but um, yeah, there's also magic with digital, it sounds like. If you, <laughs> saves yourself a lot of, um, a lot of hassle. <laughs> Um, and how how did you how did you both meet? How did you both sort of first cross paths? I think, you met, you yeah. I think we met in Delhi. Yeah, I think we met in Delhi at the uh, Oberoi Hotel. Possibly, I think we had dinner together. I'm not sure what the um, reason for that was, but we had dinner together uh, many years ago, and then of course we met again in New York. Uh, we we had a, I remember we, we had a plan to work together for National Geographic, which never came off. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And then, then we you came to the Jaipur Festival. That's right. Exactly. And, and that's yeah. when we really got to know each other. When you came for Jaipur, and, and uh, Steve right. was spectacular on stage. I had no idea. I mean, I could have guessed, but I had no idea that Steve had this enormous Indian following, and uh, uh, he was swamped yeah. by uh, by a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I'm> a... <laughs> Yeah, no, and I, everyone I, uh, has their own favorite Steve McCurry picture, you know, that they all they just they remember and uh, have yeah. brought up. And it was extraordinary seeing the the, the, the famous. It was like taking some of the Beatles around Chaipur. <laughs> 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 so, uh, what is oh, you, one thing which I, I you know I've always uh, kind of admired you for was your sort of great great aunt was. Uh, Julian uh, Margaret Cameron was one of the Correct. great photographers, not only the 19th century, but one of the great photographers of all time. And to be part of that, you know, to have that kind of bloodline thing is, I mean, that would like be like my saying, well, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson was my, you know, great, great <laughs> uncle or something. <laughs> now, that's really quite a, and, and was she- I um, friends with Lewis Carroll, with Charles Dodgson, uh, who, was, who was Lewis Carroll's real name. And they were friends, and they did. They were early photographers together. Um, oh my God! And yeah. Jimmy Martin Cameron photographed Dodson, uh, and the famous yeah. picture of Alice, the original Alice, who was uh, uh, the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland, was taken by Julie Margaret. In fact, there's a show of Alice in Wonderland on at the Victoria and Albert Museum at the moment, uh, with lots of Julie Margaret Cameron photographs of Dodson and of Alice uh, up there. Oh wow! Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. I mean, that's but she, uh... was, she, of course, was was Anglo Indian. Uh, she didn't admit uh -huh. it, but she had a Bengali. She had a Bengali grandmother who was French Bengali from Chandanagar, and she and my great grandmother, who was her younger sister, um, were all brought up in this very multilingual, half Bengali world uh, of Calcutta, and only very lately in their lives moved to London, where one of the one of their brother-in-law, there's another sister called Sarah. Uh, and one of her, uh, she married a director of the East India Company. Um, and so these guys um, moved back to a little Holland house. And Julie and Margaret used to take all the grand guests uh, of little Holland house. They had these big lunch parties on Sunday. And she used to sort of take them out of the lunch table, sit them in some bloody boat somewhere, stick a crown on them or a, uh, or a beard, and <laughs> poor Tennyson would be made to be King Arthur. And yeah. uh, Darwin would have to dress up as Gu Guinevere, and the passing priest yeah. would be sort of rolled up as a uh, as a cardinal or something. And, and suddenly you'd have you know the Knights of the Round Table, uh, and they'd <laughs> then be told not to move for five minutes while they had an exposure. Um, oh my and, God! And, and, <laughs> so there were lots of very comical stories about these. Yeah. So they were all basically returned Indians who'd come to London, and and in Julia Margaret's case, 
she went back at the end. She couldn't take the climate. And she went back to Sri Lanka. Uh, and she uh -huh. ended her day in Sri Lanka on a tea plantation. And when she left, she left with her husband and they brought two cows and two coffins because they weren't coming back. <laughs> oh my God, no kidding. Oh my God. <laughs> cows that's, for milk, that's... which they, they drank, the, drank the milk on the voyage and the coffins to be buried in. And they were. Yeah. And she's buried in Sri Lanka. That's amazing. Wow. Well, some of your, this new work is from Sri Lanka, uh, places which I'm very familiar with. And I thought, you, you know- You spent a lot of time there. Um, absolutely, Stephen. Yeah. And this was just, this was when uh, my new book has, has got a lot of Sri Lankan uh, material in it. So uh, when, uh, just before COVID hit Delhi, I, I went off to Sri Lanka uh, and um, was, was there for a month on the, on the way back here. Um, and what a, I haven't been, I covered a lot of the early stuff as a young journalist in the, in the 90s with the Tigers, all that sort of stuff. And to be honest, hadn't been back to the big sites like Anuradhapura and Ponnarua and Sigria. But they had this amazing lockdown system whereby in order to encourage tourism, they, they, they had this bubble. And you, were, you arrived, they, they gave you a PCR test at midnight or one o'clock in the morning, whatever time you reached your hotel, you got the results within 24 hours, then you were allowed out of the hotel. And after a week, and you passed another PCR test, uh, you were taken around the island, but you couldn't mix with the ordinary islands. You couldn't go and sit at the beach park, but they would allow you into Anuradhapura or Polonarua or the museum or whatever it was for two hours at, in the morning or two hours in the evening. And what it meant, because actually you know, this, this system hadn't been taken up by many people and everyone's scared of traveling in COVID. So what it meant was that I had Sigria to myself. It was like being there, uh, in the middle of the civil war, there was no one else yeah. there. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, ditto Anuradhapura, ditto Polonarua. So I had this amazing two week journey right around the island with, and you know, while life was continuing as normal, I had the great sights to myself with, with my son and was able to take fantastic shots. Plus it was the monsoon, which as you know, in Sri Lanka works like clockwork. It isn't like the Indian monsoon, which um, uh, just comes, you know, any time and, and, and drenches everything. It, it's very, it's very uh, kind of well-ordered monsoon. <laughs> and it comes that <laughs> it sort of, yeah. you know, begins to, the clouds begin to mass at three in the afternoon, uh, really heavy by four, you feel it's coming by five. And then about half past five or six, it just opens and, uh, yeah. and the rain has come down in spectacular torrents of lightning and thunder. And, and you can sit in your balcony with a drink and, and watch this drama. Um, yeah. But it's quite predictable, and it's really nice to photograph in black and white with because you get the clouds, um, which are so important yeah. in black and white landscape photography. Yeah, one of your pictures had a couple of your pictures had this very wonderful dramatic monsoon sky, which really I think um, you know shows the drama of that time it's of such year. A it it for, for black and white. I mean, you've done a, a wonderful books on the monsoon um, in color too, but. Uh, for black and white, the worst thing that can happen with is, is a blue sky. Uh, you have this very right. difficult white space uh, uh, that's difficult to do anything with. But if you have monsoon clouds, it adds drama and it looks spectacular. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm a convert to monsoon photography. I quite see why. You yeah. Into, Should we, uh, yeah. Should we? Yeah. We take a look. I, at I love that. A couple of those images. Sure. Um, while we're there's a, a, a very <laughs> an unfeasibly, unfeasibly youthful figure. <laughs> yeah. You can see that um, on that desk in front of me. This is taken in Syria in 1985 uh, when oh, I was wow. wandering around the Middle East. Yeah. And you, what you can see, uh, Steve, it's something that no kids today would know what it is. On the desk in front of me is one of those um, blow brushes. Uh, with the little kind of pneumatic thing at the end that you used to use for cleaning lenses. Oh, um, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. A little, a little blue blue thing coming out of a plastic pneumatic thing on the table. So that was for cleaning my lenses in 1985. The camera's not oh. in sight. But, uh, yeah, that's great, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like showing a bit of dinosaur. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. Uh, I, I love the... Uh, you know, you have a sort of a wonderful foreground with the figure, and then you have this incredible receding and way going way off into the distance with this sky, which is really spectacular. And um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful landscape. 
uh, and this trail, which kind of goes off into the mountain. It's just the, wait, th this is in Ladakh? So I mean, it's, it's just over the borders from Ladakh. It's actually in Pakistan, but it, it was in Ladakh pre-partition. Oh. Um, and, and what yeah. you have at the top of the hill is, a, is an old Buddhist shrine, which has become a Sufi shrine. Um, okay, right, right, and, right. And, and that is Ladakh in the distance. That's the Shayok Gorges, and that's the Indian border in the far distance. And the Siachen Glacier, in fact, is there, which India and Pakistan have fought over for so long. Um, yeah. So this is absolutely on the border of India and Pakistan. But as you know, that northern um, that northern landscape around Gilgit and Skardu and and the, and the northern territory of Pakistan is so dramatic and so beautiful. Yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's, it's gripping. Absolutely fantastic. And and you know people very like the your beloved Afghans. There, there's amazing bearded faces of these Kashmiri men with often green or blue eyes. Um, yeah, but, uh, but fewer landmines than Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, this is a, a wonderful uh, landscape. It's just uh, almost like a perfect picture, you know. Uh, it's really that's very, very yeah. sweet. Yeah. Um, so, so you you had to fly to Gilgit, and then you went there. Was it a? We actually it... we were very lucky. We were I was writing something and, and managed to talk to a friend in. Um, the Aga Khan's uh, uh, organization, who does a lot of work up there. And we ended up very glamorously, the only first and only time in my life, arrived by helicopter um, oh from, God, yeah. from Chitral. And we had this spectacular journey from Chitral over the whole width of Pakistan and landed at Kaplu on the Indian borders. We went from the Afghan border to the Indian border across the, the whole north. I've never had a more dramatic ride anywhere in my life with the whole, yeah. the whole family with me and we just sat there for i mean it was only 40 minutes uh, but we passed some of the most dramatic landscape i've ever seen ever and yeah. took some fantastic pictures i mean it, it's just these amazing water tables and, and these extraordinary mountains still topped with snow it was wonderful yeah wow that's <laughs> that's great that's but really you get there, to get there by, by any any normal route, uh, if uh, if the Khan isn't bailing you out, um, you have to go up the Karakoram Highway to Hunza and then take a right to Skardu. Uh, but it's it's one of the most dramatic rides in the world. It's a spectacular journey. Wow. Yeah, Chitral is really on the Afghan border. Uh, that's really, um, I actually I walked from Chitral into Afghanistan several times. It's just the few hours from there so uh yeah that's great I, yeah. I i when i was when i was in chitral last there'd been a lot of incursions by the taliban uh into chitral and literally i, I didn't know of course didn't know this when i was planning the trip but i thought i was going to this nice uh easy safe tourist destination and it turned out that the, the taliban had raided the valley the the kalash valley the kappa kalash valley as you were saying um, and what did they do there what, what did they uh they were just making their presence felt, showing they could do it, um, they, they flexing their muscles. Um, yeah, that's uh, the pity because that's such a beautiful. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, anyway. It turned out to be a rather more adventurous trip than we planned. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, so often the case. Yeah, no, that's great. I I, I love those uh, those pictures. Um, the the one in Delhi uh, you have of the tomb, um, which is quite because um, in in that case you know you had this one I actually photographed that location a couple of years ago. It's, it's uh, yeah. yeah, and it, this is um, you have this wonderful kind of moment where you have the the right light, and then you have this uh, person. A bicycle kind of rounding the corner so you get this wonderful shadow but this i suppose it's early morning light coming in and it's uh so you have the, the architecture but then you have this wonderful little surprise this serendipitous moment which uh, really kind of sets the whole thing off it gives a really a kind of a nice lively sense to this um ancient site you know it's really a glorious picture you, uh, you know what it's like when you're waiting for that when you know that you've got the light right, 
but you haven't quite got the picture interesting enough. You're waiting for something to happen and you sit there um, longer than you normally would, wait, waiting for that missing moment. And this is what I sat there for half an hour uh, and then this guy turned up. Bizarrely, the Archaeological Survey of India actually has an administrative office within the, within the tomb complex. Uh, and this oh. is one of the local ASI guys going in going to work. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now that's amazing. I love that. In a way, it's uh, it's um, different from some of the other pictures because you do have that kind of um, piece of action that kind of happens by uh, accident into the frame. It's wonderful. Really it's very yeah. exciting when that happens. When you when you just can add that extra, it, it's it's just you know the, uh, the the cream on top of the ice cream. It's, it's the extra. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 right. The, there's another picture. Um, you have uh, Kumara Tolley. Um, uh, right. Yeah, I thought it was really wonderful because you have all these sort of this man who's asleep. So so kind of typical of. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody to wrap himself in a blanket and then you have all these sort of idols or this um these effigies or whatever they are it, it, and it's so it kind of reminds me of uh, somebody who's ha has kind of fallen asleep and has this fantastic dream about all <laughs> these uh gods and goddesses sort of swirling around <laughs> it's it's quite extraordinary so I love that. The, yeah this is the idol makers quarter of, of calcutta which i'm sure you you photographed it's a it's a favorite ragu rai is also many famous images of this area and um this was actually taken on durga puja which is when which is the great bengali feast when they take the idols and immerse them in the ganga um and these i think basically are the unsold durgas who haven't made it have, no one's bought them we haven't completed them or, uh and um, he is, I think, actually drunk fast asleep after celebrating at Durga Puja the night before. This is actually not, not at the evening time or the morning. This was middle of the afternoon, and he's fast asleep in there oh with all his God. clothes around him. <laughs> you know, I, in, I, in my living room, I have one of those idols. It, it's before they put the, the clay on it. It's made out of um, straw. That's and right. it's just this beautiful art object, and it's without any. It's just I have it sitting there on the mantle, and it's just amazing. <laughs> I just picked it up off the floor, and I I paid him uh, fifty rupees or something for it, and uh, off I went. <laughs> it's it's a great time to visit Calcutta when when all the Bengalis from uh, from the diaspora return home. Uh, and everyone is happy. Uh, they have these the every square and every district sets up its own uh, uh, pujo, um, what they call a pundal, uh, which is a, this sort of uh, montage of, and 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 they're often quite sort of uh, uh, topical. So for, last year, for example, apparently there were a lot of um, rather than the demon um, uh, that uh, Durga was spearing, it was a coronavirus sort of you know one of those big spiky balls of coronavirus and. Uh, they were apparently very popular demons in, in Calcutta last year. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's great. That's beautiful. That's a that's a great uh, great shot. It's amazing. Um, so, so uh, how many uh, photographs in the exhibition? Uh, Charlie, do you remember how many? About fifty. Yeah, yeah, just over forty. Forty-one. We cut it down from uh, yeah a, a larger selection, and I was very grateful. I thought. I thought um, you guys at the gallery had had a very uh, uh, enlightened choice of, uh, of of the images, and I, I think it's much the stronger for the for the edit that you gave it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish I was there to see it in person. Um, maybe uh... coming to New York, actually, Steve. We're going to be it's going to be at the Sundaram Tagore Gallery um, next year. So uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. No, he's a, he's a. I've actually worked with him a few times he's, he's, a, he's, yeah. he's, he's a lot he absolutely yeah no he's a um it's a wonderful gallery and he's always a like the delight to spend time with so uh yeah now, now i'm very lucky and, and so uh yeah so the next year so we have to get you along so that's next year so in other words it'll be like next um uh, uh, i think by the time it's done probably it'll be it'll be yeah it'll be into next year rather than this year but we'll see maybe maybe the end of this year 
Great. Okay, well, I'll see you then. I think the exhibition schedule has been, like everything else in this world, buggered up by pandemics and corona. So yeah. we've got a great backlog of, sh of shows uh, yeah. to get through. Now. Yeah. Wow. Have you yeah. managed to have shows, Steve, in the middle of all this? Are you showing, you usually seem to be showing in about 10 different cities at any one moment with, uh, um, I've seen your work up in Paris and Rome and uh, London and uh, New York, in India. You always seem to be ha have this wonderful international network of uh, galleries that you work with. Well, I have a show now in Antwerp and one in, uh, in Zurich. Uh, <laughs> There's one in, in Graz, in Austria, and then one in uh, uh, Puglia, in Italy, and also in um, Trentino, in Italy. So, so um, we can do a little tour, a Macari tour of Italy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's. Uh, I, I, uh, we'll be quite near Trentino next week, so I'll see if I can pop in and see. Yeah, I think it's on a mountain people around the world or something. That's the theme of the show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is this is the dream. You get, you get to, you arrive at Steve McCurry's status. You have ten exhibitions simultaneously at any given moment at every continent on earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Um, well, shall we shall we, um, shall we look at um, some of Steve's images? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's see some of Steve's classic works of yours, William. Um, oh, mine. Okay, whichever. Which um, which we can sort of just. Uh, I think we should. Um, I think I think that's probably better just to concentrate on on, on Willie's pictures because uh, let's not. Um, I think that might be one picture. One picture definitely I'd like to see of Steve's before we talk any more about mine is this wonderful picture of Herapt that you uh, put up of the uh, uh, because we should all be thinking of Afghanistan at the moment. I think it's the last one on your slideshow, um, uh, Charlie, uh, right. of the. And there we go, and very youthful Steve as well. This is youthful Steve with a big <laughs> turban. <laughs> in the big. Of... <laughs> uh, but there's, I think there's one from uh, Mazar Sharif. Yeah, it's Mazar, Mazar. It's Mazar, not Herat. Yeah, here we go. Ah, oh, Kolkata, here we go, Agra. That one, yeah. Mazar. So we should all yeah. be thinking about Afghanistan at the moment, Steve, because you know you and I have oh both spent God. a lot of time there, and, and we've had a lot of hospitality from Afghans and. Um, both of us have seen what a spectacular country with amazing people it is. And it's yeah, not I was just, good for us. Not yeah, I was good just for thinking, I, I was just thinking before we uh, spoke about the, like the National Museum, because uh, the last time the Taliban came to town, they like smashed all the, whatever they could smash, uh, statues and sculpture and, and uh, pottery and, um, I just wonder if yet again there's another plan to kind of evacuate all that stuff. I, I, Ashraf Ghani, the president, is a very gra a very good and distinguished historian. So I suspect that uh, he, of all people, will have taken care to make sure that either flown out or hidden well. But yeah, as, uh, exactly what I was thinking. I've been actually working on uh, Gandhara uh, for my next book at the moment, and. Uh, uh, been looking at all the amazing gold from Tiliatepe, which uh, one of the great finds of uh, and one of the great treasures of the National Museum in Afghanistan. And exactly, yeah. who, are they burying it? Are they getting it out of the country? It, 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 they they can't let it fall into the hands of the Taliban again. Yeah, I um, you know, there were all those stories about hiding things behind false walls and all. This. It just it just seems like can they managed to pull a rabbit out of a hat again, uh, boy, it would be, yeah. you know, I, I, I was back there in, uh, you know, 2004, or whatever, and they were painstakingly trying to reconstruct these things. And, um, you know, you just wonder. What's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen next? And they have reconstructed, I was there a bit more recently than that, 2006 or seven, and, uh, the Kanishka statue, which is one of the great treasures with this great baggy pair of Stalvar communities. And that, that had been put back together. You could see, you could see where it had been smashed, but uh, they had succeeded in, in, in resurrecting something. Uh, of course, yeah. the, the Damian Buddhas will never be resurrected. But yeah. more than that, you know, one of, I mean, if we 
Charlie, just bring up some of um, Steve's amazing pictures of those Afghan faces that you had on that slideshow. It's the people of Afghanistan who we must really worry about now because they, they have not got um, things of, you know, apparently there are huge, according to the New York Times this week, there are huge queues at the passport offices again. Everyone wants to get a passport. Everyone wants to try and leave for Iran or, or Pakistan. Can we get the, one of the faces, um, Johnny? Well, I think there's a, the only one is this um, Afghan, uh, the, this Indian. Um, Nomad. Um, yeah, that's that's me and this one of the book. Uh, your your Afghan book was I think the first time you and I ever worked together. Um, you very sweetly asked me to write the uh, the introduction to that, which was a huge privilege. And I, I remember this yeah. picture. Uh, yeah, yeah. But all yeah. these guys now, you know, very uncertain future uh, and tragic at the way that both our countries have pulled out, leaving these guys in the lurch. Yeah, all the translators and people, it just breaks your heart to think of what's going to happen to them. And all the girls and their dreams of uh, a future and education or whatever, just it's just not going to happen. The, the um, most awful story I heard last week, the New York Times said that the uh, when they pulled out of Bagram Air Base, they left something like 3,000 brand new vehicles, but they took the car keys with them. I mean, what? What's how's that meant to help anyone? How's that meant to either make yeah. friends, influence people, to leave, to have the excess wealth that you can leave three thousand incredibly expensive Humvees and and, and enormous and, take, and but take the keys with you? What's going on in their head? It seems sort of mean spirited, and yeah. um, somebody was just trying to yeah make you know that's that's terrible. That's really a, that's a, that's what what I don't know. It's just it's it's just terrible. The whole thing is terrible, and there's no nothing good, you know. I can think of. Um, and they drawn just, it down to only about three thousand troops. It wasn't like it was an enormous commitment of a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand troops as it was at the peak of the surge. Three thousand troops is manageable, and it's cheaper than yeah. reinvading the country in five years when Al Qaeda or ISIS or whoever it is moves in again. Because we still have uh, troops in, uh, we still have troops in Korea and Japan and and Germany. We have troops all yeah. over the world, you know. Shall so. we? Uh, shall we look again at a couple of William's photographs? The, the, there's lasting Buddha, or what? 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 What do you? What, what would you? What should we do? Oh. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, the fasting Buddha. I think that's uh, to me, it's uh, incredibly uh, powerful image that's yeah. if you go back actually that one there is is afghan the one before the close-up that's the terracotta buddha from hada in afghanistan uh, and this is an interesting story because uh, it's in the it's in the met museum in new york now um and uh thank god because it was uh the, the site of hada which is one of the great uh, afghan buddhist monasteries um became a mujahideen command post during the soviet era and the Soviets dropped one of their biggest bombs on the site, completely destroying un unnumbered treasures like this, this incredibly elegant, incredibly refined style of terracotta uh, Buddha. It's quite late, set seventh, sixth, seventh century, at the end of the story of, of Gandharan Nath. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're going to see many more acts of destruction like that in the, in the years to come, sadly. Yeah. Anyway, back, to, back to the fasting Buddha. Well, it's, you know, in Buddhism, it's a story of uh, Siddhartha and going through all these stages of um, denial, self-denial and asceticism and, and then eventually realizing, uh, but it's, it's just a, the intensity of the, the commitment and the, the dedication in this, uh, you know, and, and you see the lengths he was willing to go to through to achieve um, you know enlightenment is, is really in, in, in some versions of this one not actually on the Lahore one which this is but in other versions of the starving but in the Kashmiri ones particularly they have on the base uh, that moment when Sujata brings to him a glass of milk a bowl of milk uh, and this is of course when the Buddha gets enlightenment it's not when he's doing the extreme asceticism it's when he accepts the milk and, and realizes that 
extreme asceticism, which is often aimed at Jainism, which has this very rigorous uh, starvation to death and so forth. The Buddha seeks the middle way, uh, which is not sensuality, it's not extreme asceticism, it's the middle. And so uh, in, in some versions, they actually explain what the, the sculpture is about by having the girl offering milk on the pedestal, uh, Sujata. Oh, okay. Uh, and, right. and, it, and, it, and it's the real, it's the moment of realization when you realize it's the middle way. That's the moment of enlightenment. So it's it's a lovely uh, image, and you're meant to be slightly horrified by the asceticism. It's, it 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 seeks to show that asceticism is not the way. You do not want to end up with your eyes hollowed out and your stomach uh, touching your rib cage and your uh, uh, mm -hmm. the back of your spine. Um, but what right. a, what a vision! And what and what incredible anatomical knowledge has gone into that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's part one, you know, it's just one of those images you can't ever forget once you've seen it, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, and the other picture of, um, there's uh, the light, it's a torso, you have um, an image, uh, on a, yes, the other Buddha, um, yeah, this is, uh, again, it reminds me of a wonderful, uh, Italian sculpts where they're able to, uh, you know, uh, do some wonderful work with um, embroidery or some kind of a robe, and it it has a really a lifelike feel to it, and it's just a beautiful the the skin and the the shape and the light and this uh, it's just a, a so this wonderful... is the uh, this is in, in a sense the golden age of India sculpture. This is the Gupta period now. This is a little bit after the two Gandharan works we just looked at, and. Um, there's great humanism at this period in, in Indian art. And this Bodhisattva is from Sarnath, which is the uh, one of the, the, the important sites of the Buddha's life, um, the site of the deer park where he made the first sermon. And this image shows, again, this fantastic anatomical knowledge. You can see every fold of his tummy, the, the, the nipples, the belly button, and, and also the two pajama strings. That's keeping his that's keeping his lungi, yeah. his lungi or his uh, pajamas on, and they're just shown. And all I did was to put a put a put a, a another um, phone light uh, raking from one side, and that just brought out this uh, uh, yeah. incredible uh, 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 the way that the, the the garments cling to the body. It's just a gorgeous thing. Yeah, I was wondering because it looked like the light was like absolutely perfect to reveal the shape. And I wasn't sure if that was something that was existing in the museum or if that was I mean, something. As you, know, as you know, for all the wonders in, the muse in museums, the, the lighting is often not the uh, the strongest uh, anyway. Right. Uh, yeah. There's a little bit of distance there from another cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. There you go. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I sometimes use a little LED, LED light, just a little one you can kind of stick in your pocket. That's sometimes good Very too. Good. Like, yeah. What I what I love is you say about about mobile phones and yes, this, this is all taken is 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 the discretion of it, the fact that you're not advertising that you're a photographer or you're you're out there, you know, um, on the hunt. Uh, and and when you hear those those thirties photographers or right up to sixties photographers like Cartier Bresson, but Kappa too in the in thirties with their small Leicas, and what they loved about those Leicas was that they were tiny. Uh, the previous generation of photographers had used you know, large format with big glass plates or whatever and tripods and what have you and lighting and light meters and everything else. Uh, but these guys had those little Leicas that they could just keep in their pocket that had a very, very quiet shutter. No one knew they were taking the pictures. And I kind of feel certain that Kappa and Bresson, if they were alive today, um, would be using cell phones. They would totally get the whole idea yeah. of cell phones. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. The, the the quality, actually, I think you can achieve more in some ways with with the cell phone than you can um, with a kind of a thirty five millimeter camera. Um, it, it's it's just it's uh, it's a different time than yeah. cell phones of years ago. They're really the quality is just spectacular. Is it so, is the, uh, the, the, that you almost have the like you say the element of ambush. Yeah. Whereas if you are, I, I have often pretended to be sending an email or something when I'm taking a photograph. You just do it, you know, tap your fingers on the screen, and everyone goes to sleep thinking you think you're sending an email. You're composing a shot. It's very, it's very yeah. neat. 
<laughs> that's great. That's really great. Yeah. Steve, you've been so generous for this. I'm I, I'm really so grateful. Thank you so much for uh, for giving time to this, and and and, and uh, I, I I'm humbled by your endorsement. I'm very very grateful. Well, best of luck with the exhibition there. Um, look forward to seeing you in New York. Um, Hopefully we'll be there at the same time. And um, I hope- if not, uh, there, if not there, somewhere in South Asia. Absolutely. Look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you for yeah. organizing. Thank you both so much. It's, it's Thank you very much. Lovely Pleasure. to hear it. So, um, no. William's show is on in the, in the gallery in London until the 30th of July. Um, so hopefully as many of you can come see it as possible. But anyway, thank you, both of you. It's been a pleasure.